Hey guys, in this note, we will be examining your freedom of speech as uh, defined by the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and all the complexity that exists in a, what people often believe is a very straightforward rule in our charter. Um, all throughout all of the rights we're going to learn about, I want you to be considering what I have identified in this bullet. The rights of the individual versus the rights of the majority. In case of freedom of speech, it's the right of the individual to express whatever they want to express versus the right of the rest of society or specific groups not to be impacted by that speech. So please keep this idea in mind when you're listening to the rest of this presentation. So, as defined by the Charter, so freedom of speech is the right to articulate one's opinions and ideas without fear of government retaliation or censorship. This is 2B of the Charter. So this is important to realize that when we're talking about your freedom of, of expression in the Charter, it is your relationship with the government, what the government can, can retaliate against you or censor you with. So not just other individuals, just the government. Uh, the Charter guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be sorry, demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So this is our reasonable limits clause. So we have our freedom of speech and our reasonable limits clause. So when we're thinking about this, what are the limits on speech that exist right now? So typically I would throw this out to the class and who can think of any th way in which the government limits your ability to say anything. And there's two big ones. Number one is uttering a violent threat. You can't just say, I'm going to blankety blank you and make again, someone feel in fear for their life again. So uttering a violent threat is number one, that simple assault. The second one is defamation, defaming someone's character either slander, which is you orally defame someone's character, or libel, where you put it in, in print or in permanent form. So those are the two big ones. So again, right off the bat, we do limit, again, your freedom of speech through again, protecting people from uh, uttering violent threats and through anti-defamation laws. And again, but we're now living in 2020, and there are certain quirks when it comes to freedom of speech. And the first one is I'm going to ask you to consider is, does something said online mean less than something said verbally? So if I say something online, again, maybe I'm joking. Maybe I'm being crass. Maybe I'm being edgy. You can't see my air quotes right now. Uh, but a lot of people do take this opinion where if I, something is said online, it shouldn't be taken as seriously as as if it were actually said to a person, like person to person. And this is a Facebook post, again, by a black woman who obviously is upset about the way um, police officers are treating black Americans, and rightfully so. Again, we're living in a historical moment right now where this is really at the forefront of what we are talking about as a society, the relationship between individuals and minorities in particular and police officers. Uh, but again, if, if you read this, you can definitely tell, um, again, further along in this, like, uh, I thought about shooting every white cop I see in, in the head until I'm either caught or killed by the police. Ha, I think I can pull it off. Um, I might kill 15 tomorrow. I'm plotting now. So as much as we understand the anger and the intensity of why she's saying it, Again, this is a clear violent threat. Again, this is clearly that first case, that first place where we're um, restricting freedom of speech. Even though we understand why she's saying it, we understand the anger behind it, this is still a limitation. And from a less controversial point of view, food, uh, kind of online restaurant reviews, I took these off of TripAdvisor uh, and these are ratings of local restaurants. And again, I obviously, I pulled two that were very terrible reviews. So first one is food is horrible, experience is horrible. Dirty spoons, forks given to eat with, uh, food clearly not freshly made, 
food on the sweet side, not Thai, hair and food, dirty plates and teapot given to eat and drink from. Second one, dirty hair, uh, found hair was served food made hours ago. So these are very, very negative reviews. But how do I know if they're true or not? How do I know it's not a competitor of these businesses leaving terrible reviews or a former maybe disgruntled employee? So this is a lie. This is liable in a sense if it's untrue. But how do we know? Because, or maybe this is just someone playing a prank on these restaurants. But from my point of view, when I saw these reviews, I did not eat at these restaurants and they did not get my business. Um, I will include this presentation so you can kind of follow this link. Uh, but this is a man named Jim Keekstra. And he was actually back in the 1980s, uh, the mayor of a city or a town in Alberta called Eckville. And he was a social science history teacher at the Eckville High School. Um, and the controversial part of the story is that he was teaching his students absolute rubbish. He was teaching his students, again, anti-Semitic anti ideas, anti-Jewish ideas, and just complete nonsense about you know, Jewish people's role in history and the Holocaust in general. But the one thing about Keekstra is when you watch this video, you don't believe he's lying. He's wrong, but you don't believe he's lying. So again, I'm going to pose this to the class. Should you be punished for expressing something you truly believe in? Again, Usually with defamation and other types of um, and expression, again, those people are lying and they know they're lying. But do we make a distinction about punishing this man because he actually truly believes he's right, even though he's 100% wrong? So it's one of the complexities here. So please make sure you watch that video, you follow that link before you move on, to this, move on in this presentation. So it also begs the question, should some professions, in this case teaching, have more, so have more or less freedom of speech than others? So in this case, I'll be perfectly blunt, teachers do have less freedom of speech than the average individual because how we express ourselves could impact our ability to do our job. If I said something outrageous, and I hope I would never do that, um, that offended somebody or made them less likely to come to class or be engaged in school, that impacts their education and the ability to do my job. So again, teachers can be punished, again, professionally, maybe even losing their job by what they say online. But there, you could come up with other ones as well. Police officers are often considered like this, doctors. So this is our second case study and there will be a Google form that I would like you to fill out about the Dalhousie dental students. Uh, but again, just to summarize what you will watch in this video, uh, a group of male dentistry students again had a closed Facebook group where they shared a lot of inappropriate and inappropriate is putting it very mildly uh, comments about their female peers in the Dalhousie dental program. So I would like you to watch um, this video and then fill out the Google form connected to uh, this video and can consider what should be the fate of these Dalhousie down to dental students. And kind of my last comment and the last thing I would like the kind of class to consider and at least think about, hypothesize about is should someone face punishment for something they say on a closed Facebook group or does that even matter? So again, that's my kind of final comment here is like with, for a, a being about, again, if something is meant to be kept private and it happens to become public, should that kind of be factored in when we're assessing how these people should be punished either academically, in this case with the Dalhousie dental students or criminally? If you have any questions, uh, make sure to leave them in uh, or on Google Classroom and make sure to fill out the Google form that goes along with this uh, Dalhousie case study. That's it.